Ladies, do we have an amazing episode coming your way today? So you all know, based on my book, You, Me, and Anxiety, that I'm a total geek when it comes to the brain. I talk a lot about mindset and how we can rewire our brain, retrain our brain, change those negative anxious thoughts to positive thoughts so that we can have more positive experiences, that our thoughts create our results, that, that I geek out on all of that stuff. Well, Hold on, because today I'm going to be geeking out a lot because I have a very special guest who is a brain expert, I guess you could say, but he's going to teach us how we can learn better and how we can really partner with our brains to make the most out of our lives, our businesses, make better decisions, which is so key for any level of success in life or business that we want to achieve. So we may even touch on some learning challenges that people experience and how to learn better even under those circumstances. So hold on to your hats because we're going to dive into some really scientific clinical stuff, but not in an overwhelming way. It'll be in a way that you can easily understand it and then apply it to your daily lives as you learn how to better partner with your brain. So without further ado, Colin Jewett, welcome to the Robin Graham show. Thanks, Robin. So happy to be here. I'm definitely not a brain expert, so I'm going to take that off the table. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I help people in a very practical, applied way how to understand how to interact with their brain better. Okay. I still think you're a brain expert. The nitty gritty, right? <laughs> I know a decent amount of nitty gritty, but there's just too much to know. <laughs> oh my gosh. The brain is so complicated and it's so intricate. And it just amazes me how every single piece of our past, including our ancestry, affects our brain and how we think and how we perceive the world around us and situations and experiences. So I think this is going to be a really cool conversation because a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs are, I guess everyone, we get in places in our life where we just feel stuck. We feel overwhelmed. We have anxiety or other factors that can completely stress us out and burn us out. And I think that this conversation is going to help everybody understand the brain a little bit better to try to navigate all of those different scenarios versus staying stuck and staying in that place of just feeling like their brain's not working the way they want it to work. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I hear that sentiment a lot. I, is my brain broken? <laughs> I get that yeah. question. Yeah, I can describe imagine. It. <laughs> I can describe imagine. their situation and they're just like, I cannot get myself to do what I want to do. And I don't understand why it's yeah. a, a weird phenomenon. And I think as we age too, I don't know if you hear this a lot, but I have found focus is really hard. And I had those focus challenges when I was younger too, but it's hard to focus under different circumstances. So if you're experiencing a loss or a major situation in your life, a challenge or something, I think that is when our brain, whoa, I'm dealing with this emotional thing right now. I can't focus on that. I can't do that. And so how we can even dive into maybe how we navigate that as well. But before we dive into all of this stuff that I'm going to geek out on, what is your background? Can you just tell us your story and how you got into this? You're so young and you are killing it in life and business. So I would like you to give everyone just a little bit of background on, on you and your backstory. Sure. Yeah. So my path is, is a strange one. I'll start with college. So we don't need to go through my entire life story, but I went to school for engineering in college. So I was trained as an industrial engineer at Purdue. And I think that's a good place to start because I think that's really where I started to recognize my need to understand my brain a little bit better. So I had always done really well in, in school, all the way through high school. I never really had to try. I never learned how to study. I never took notes and I did well. And then I got to college and everything was the opposite. I went from being the fast kid who never had to try to being the slow kid who I just felt like I was drowning all the time. And so I think, and you brought up entrepreneurs. Um, I think everybody needs to develop their self-knowledge. I think that's really important, but I think entrepreneurs often realize that quickly when they get into entrepreneurship, because when you're working in maybe a normal job and you have a boss and everything like that, it's easy to not to recognize the degree to which your own lack of self-knowledge is your bottleneck. When you're an entrepreneur and you're self-directed and you have to make your own decisions on everything, 
you start to really recognize that and to come to grips with the fact that you don't really understand yourself very well. And so that's what happened to me in college. I got to the point where everything that I was trying and everything I thought should work didn't work. I started to do all the things that I'd always been told worked, take notes, go to office hours with instructors and read over and over again, the content, do practice problems and just nothing worked for me. So I ended up going to the disability resource center. I was like, I don't know what's wrong with my brain. <laughs> they just told me I had really bad testing anxiety and they gave me some extra time and space, but that was a band-aid solution. It was like, okay, that's going to help me have a little less anxiety on exams, but it doesn't address the fact that I don't understand how my brain works and I don't understand how to use it effectively. And so I uh, desperately was scraping around the internet looking for like tips and tricks and hacks and things I could do. And I stumbled across Jonathan Levy's course on what he calls super learning. And that really started a, a change for me where I, I think the biggest thing I got from that course, there's a lot of cool techniques, but the biggest thing I got was I can actually figure things out. I can experiment on myself to see what works well for me. And for some reason, I just never had really thought about the fact that there's things that I can figure out about myself that I can't look up on the internet, <laughs> that I can't read in a book. And it's only by experimenting with myself and introspection that I can figure them out. And so I think that really reignited my love of learning and my excitement for everything I could explore about what am I capable of? What can I really do? And how do I unlock that potential? Re went really deep down that rabbit hole. I'm still going down that rabbit hole. And what I help people to do now is to go on that journey for themselves and learn how to partner more effectively with their unique brains. I love that so much. And I'm curious, what did you discover worked for you? Like mm -hmm. when you said nothing was working, the traditional mm -hmm. study methods and things like that. So what ended up working for you? In terms of like nitty gritty, actual techniques for doing school better or yeah. more generally speaking. Yeah. Okay. So some things that I found, I think the reason I didn't take notes when I was younger is because I realized that for me, first of all, I have an ext extremely like narrow funnel of attention, which is true to some degree for everybody. But if I'm taking notes, I'm not actively processing what's being said. I'm not thinking about the ideas. It's very much like an automated process of just get my hand to move, <laughs> write down the words, things like that. I, and yeah. what I realized, and this will apply for everybody, is that uh, learning is what happens inside your head is a whole lot more important than what happens outside your head. So for example, people ask me all the time, if they're learning something, should I use flashcards? Should I listen to these audiobooks? Should I, they talk about all these different tools. Should I mind map? Should I take notes? Whatever. And ultimately when it comes to learning, if you can't explain a topic in your own words, if you can't describe it in a way that makes sense to you in a very simple language, what that means is that you haven't actually integrated it. You haven't taken the unfamiliar and put it into a familiar context. And until you do that, you don't really understand it. And so I don't care if you take notes or if you use flashcards or read books or listen to whatever. What I care about is what's happening in here. Are you actually going through the process of thinking about, okay, how would I describe this? How would I explain this to a five-year-old? What kind of imagery comes to my mind when I'm thinking about this? And then actually testing that understanding by taking action on it and then seeing if your predictions about your actions actually come to fruition or if they're wrong and then asking why. So that's what really matters. That's what's going to determine whether you understand something or learn something or not the specific tool that you use, because that can really vary person to person, situation to situation. Okay. So that's deep. So how can listeners apply that to their daily decision-making in business? Yeah. So this gets into a lot of different things. I'm going to start with one framework that I've found to be really helpful and empowering for identifying how you currently do things and then how you might improve. When it comes to learning, people typically throw, fall into three personality camps, I'm going to say, or mindsets, you could call it different things. So they either operate as a hobbyist is learning just for fun. They are a hoarder is learning just in case or they are a hunter and a hunter is learning just in time. Generally speaking, young children, especially if they don't get it beaten out of them, so to speak, will fall into the hobbyist camp. What they're learning, it doesn't mean it's not practical. It's extraordinarily practical what they learn, but their approach to learning, the way they think about learning is it's fun. It's the things that I enjoy and that's what I'm exploring. And they don't really think about it as I'm learning stuff, especially when they're really young. 
And older folks, especially retirees, also tend to fall in the hobbyist camp more of the time where it's, I'm just learning things because I like the process. I'm learning a language because I want to, and it's not necessarily to get to any sort of goal. The hunter is, they're learning for a very specific reason. They know exactly what it is they need to learn and why, and they only care about that and they can block out everything else. They recognize that it doesn't matter that something is valuable to someone somewhere sometime. All that matters is what's most valuable to me right now. Now, very few people fall into the hunter camp almost ever. <laughs> it's very rare that I find somebody who's operating in that way, even though it's extremely effective. Most people are in the hoarder camp. In other words, they're thinking all information is valuable, which is true, but it's valuable to somebody somewhere sometime. Is it the most valuable thing to you right now? Probably not but they are just in case thinkers. They're thinking maybe this will be useful to me at some point in the future. And I wouldn't want to miss out on that. And I'd feel really dumb if I, if I missed out on this opportunity to learn this thing and then later I need it. And they're always thinking about that. And the way you can identify if you're a hoarder, are you the kind of person who buys online courses and then doesn't get very far through them, buys a bunch of them, buys a lot of books and doesn't really finish reading them most of the time, is constantly getting interested in new things, but never really going super deep on anything. That's the hoarder mentality because it's paradoxically um, preventing you from really getting deep into anything because every time you start to explore, something else pops up. Like, oh, that could be important. And then you go that direction <laughs> and you end up with a brain that's just full of disjointed, not very useful information that you're not really sure how to apply and you feel like you're always missing out. And that's where I find most people, especially if you're the kind of person who has 50 million tabs open on your computer because <laughs> you're afraid of closing them because you don't want to lose whatever it was that you were looking at. That's that harder <laughs> mentality. So one of the most useful things people can do, especially entrepreneurs, because they tend to be in that shiny object syndrome camp, is you need to start to systematize and you need to start prioritizing. You need to say, okay, here is what is valuable to me. And you need to have a process for saying no. So that means you identify here's what's most valuable to me right now. And here's why. And every time something else pops up, you have to ask the question, what am I willing to say no to in order to say yes to this shiny object? Am I willing to say no to that thing I just said is my number one priority? Because you always have to say no before you can truly say yes to anything. There's always an opportunity cost. And if you're co not cognizant of that, and if you're not paying attention you're just going to end up saying no to your most important thing in favor of something that's not as important. And then just saying no to that two days later, <laughs> and you're going to keep doing that. Never really being able to truly say yes or commit to anything. If you think about it, like when people get married, traditionally, they have to forsake all others, right? You yeah. can't get married and then be like, okay, I'm going to forsake some others, but not all or something like that it typically doesn't work very well. Right. Just the, the statistics speak for themselves. And that's because it's not just about you can split your time between different things. You can have different interests. We have to understand even when you do that, your brain is now splitting its attention between those things. So yeah. if you were just solely focused, like for a while, I was really focused on playing guitar. It's not that I was playing guitar all day. But it is like when I was doing other things, I was still thinking about guitar. My brain was all the time focused on that. And when you start to say yes to other things, you start to say no to the opportunity for your brain to explore that thing you really care about during all those other hours of the day. And when you're sleeping and when you have downtime. And so it really does detract, even if you feel like I can have five priorities, you can have five priorities, but it's not the same as having one. That kind of goes along with breaking down your goals too. Like you don't want to have five big major goals and then try to accomplish all of them at the same time. It's better to take one goal, break it down into three steps, and then focus on those three steps for a certain length of time until you accomplish the goal, then move on to the next goal. Otherwise you are, you're diverting your brain power. You're not able to be all in your partway in to multiple things. So you're not as productive. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's the same exact issue. And people think that they're really good at saying yes to things because they say yes a lot. <laughs> but you can't say yes until you've said no. That's one of the things I want to just hammer into people. So you need to figure out what your process is for saying no to things. Okay, so what is there a specific process that you follow for each one of those learning types in order to learn to say no? Or is yeah. how does that work? Well, here's what I would say. I'd say that the hoarder mentality is never effective when it comes to learning. It's never going to help you. <laughs> so you don't want to be in that camp. 
being in the hobbyist camp is great. It's fun. And that's just when you've decided, hey, this is something I want to do because it's fun and it's an end in itself. And so I'm willing to say no to, to certain things in order to say yes to this. But yeah, you should always have that criteria defined. You should say, here's why I'm saying yes to this. And here's what would have to be true in order for me to say no. And one of the reasons why people really struggle with that is because in order to be able to say no to things, that means you have to have a hierarchy of values. Not everything can be equal. You can't have a flat, like it's not like all values are the same. You have to have a hierarchy of values. And most people have not defined what that is for them. They can't say, here's my top three values, rattle them off. Here's what they look like. Here's the behaviors that go along with those values. If you can't do that, then how on earth do you think you're going to be able to say no to things that you need to say no to? You don't have anything to base it off of, or at least it's not conscious and you can't articulate it. And so that's what I would re really recommend to people like sit down and a really great way to do this is write down the top three values that come to mind. When you say, what are the three values I want to live by? Just do the first three that come to mind. Because usually there's a reason they came to mind first. And then only after you spitball those three, then see if you can replace any of them. And then once you feel like you're happy with that three, break down each one and say, what does this look like? When have I seen people exhibit this value? What was it about the way that they behaved that showed me what this value looked like? How am I going to live this out in my life? What decisions am I going to make? What things do I say no to because I'm following this value? So every time that you have a new shiny object pop up and you're trying to decide, do I want to say yes to this? Do I want to say no to this? You look at your values and say, which one is more aligned with my values? Is it the shiny object or is it the thing I was prioritizing before? If it's the thing that you were prioritizing before, you need to say no to the new opportunity so you can say yes to that. But most people haven't gone through that process. So it's very difficult mm -hmm. to do that consciously if you have no hierarchy of values defined. Yeah, absolutely. And that's so when when I work with my clients, the, one of the first things we do is we identify our values, visions, and passions because where those overlap is where your ultimate purpose is. And so when you have confusion on your values and you are not living in alignment with your values, you, and we could even say you're scatterbrained, right? But what's happening is you're letting outside influences influence your behaviors, your actions, and everything you're doing. Thus, you're not being your true authentic self. You're not being genuine. And so you're not creating and developing genuine relationships that are going to ultimately, in the entrepreneur's case, convert to clients. So it's really important to know those values and adhere to them. And if listeners are curious about where you can find a list of values, you can actually just Google that, Google a list of values. But James Clear has a list on his website. I think he has like the top 50 values or most whatever. And so what I always suggest to people is go through that list and write down that the 10 or 15 that resonate with you that you think you're aligned with, and then go back and look to see, because ultimately there will be words that are very similar in meaning or values that are very similar in meaning. And then you can narrow it down again. So once you have those 10 or 15, narrow it down to say seven to 10, and then narrow it down to three to five. And then those become the core values that you want to adhere to in everything you do. And I think this is what Colin's saying is that then you can say yes to the things that are aligned with that. And you can say yes to the people, the clients that you want to work with that are aligned with that. And then you can say no to those things or people that are not aligned with that. And that crosses over from everything from business to decisions, to social decisions, relationship decisions, and everything. So great advice. I love that. Yeah. Something else that I think comes into play, and I know you said you really like the brain stuff, so this might be a good opportunity to jump into that a little bit. So one thing I want to talk about is we have a model of ourselves, and we have a model of the world, and maybe it's implicit, maybe you haven't articulated what that looks like, but you have one in your head, and that's how you make predictions about what results your behaviors are going to get for you, and what your experiences are likely to be like. So in other words, we say, I'm like this, we have a model of ourselves. Therefore, when I interact with the world in a certain way, here's how I'm going to feel when I do that. And here's the results I'm going to get. And that's how we essentially make rational decisions about our behaviors. One of the problems is that most people that I talk to anyway, their model of themselves doesn't work very well. In other words, when they say, all right, I'm going to go do this thing, or they make certain plans. And they predict by making those plans, they're predicting that they're actually going to stick to them or that those are going to get the results they want. And then either they don't actually stick to the plans that they made 
or when they do follow through with the plans, they don't feel the way they thought they were going to feel, or they don't get the results they thought they were going to, they were going to get. And so from a scientific perspective, you'd say, well, that's a bad model because it can't make good predictions. So why do you keep that model? But people keep just using the exact same model over and over again, making assumptions about themselves. And then those assumptions continue to be proven wrong over and over again. So especially for entrepreneurs, I see this all the time, since you have to be much more self-directed, people will make plans, they'll make their checklists, maybe whatever, and then they won't actually stick to it. And so question I think that's really important to ask is, how is it that I can do something that I don't want to do or that I didn't want to do? Doesn't, isn't that a contradiction in terms? Like if I want to do something, I'll do it. And I've written these things down that I want to do and then I didn't do it. That makes no sense. And I think a big reason why that happens is because people assume that there's some sort of unified personality. They are just, they are one person in their head. They've got one personality. That's who they are. And so there's no reason why that personality wouldn't do anything other than what it wants to do. And I think this is a bad model. It just doesn't work for you because the truth is there are many personalities inside your head. You don't have to be schizophrenic for that to be true. It's true of everybody. So there are different characters you could say that are at play and that are negotiating constantly inside your mind. And if you pretend like there's only one there, you're going to be really confused when one of the other ones takes control and is guiding your behavior because you have nothing in your model to explain what's happening. So I think a really useful, practical understanding of some things that are going on in your brain. So you've got your cerebral cortex, which is the outer layer. It's pretty big in humans. And especially in the front, that's where you've got your prefrontal cortex. You've probably heard your audience has probably heard of that. I'm sure you've probably talked about it before. A lot of your executive decision-making happenings, a lot of what you consider to be your conscious self, that inner voice floating around up there. But there's a lot more to your brain than just your cerebral cortex. There's all of the parts of the, the hindbrain, you've got your medulla, your pons, your cerebellum, you've got your midbrain, you've got your subcortical structures. And those do things, it's not just your rational mind that does everything. And they have personalities, they have influences on the way that you think, the way that you behave. And I think if I remember correctly, this is there's some faith components of this podcast. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I wanted to bring up something. So I grew up in a Christian tradition and I remember that when I was younger, oftentimes I was told that if I was dealing with some sort of temptation or I was doing things that I didn't want to do, one of the ways I could mitigate that behavior was by opening the Bible and reading a Bible verse. And I'm not discouraging people from doing that. I think it's an infinite amount of wisdom to be gained there. But the problem is, I think that's a very rational approach. And a lot of your behavior is not rational. So you can't deal with them in the same way that you would deal with. Because oftentimes when you do something you don't want to do, if you try to go back and explain why you did it, rationality is not it. I was thinking these were my options and I thought that was the best option. So I selected it. It's no, that's not why you yelled at your spouse. It's not because you, you decided that was the best option at the time. It's because there's something else at play. And oftentimes those lower drives, especially from hypothalamus, which is driving a lot of your, your survival based behavior. In other words, reproduction, eating, sleeping, drinking fluids, all that kind of thing. If you're doing things you don't want to do that are related to those kind of functions, you can't solve them in by reading a book, like just reading a book, isn't going to do it. Reading a Bible verse, memorizing something. That's not the case. You need to respond in a way that fulfills that function of that same problematic behavior. So one example I get all the time, people tell me I'm on YouTube all the time. I can't stop. I just, or TikTok or (laughs) whatever it is. I can't stop myself. And they're like, what should I do? Maybe I should replace this behavior by instead, I'm going to replace that with personal development time where I'm going to go journal and I'm going to read, or I'm going to do workouts or something like that. I'm like, those two things are different. Your brain is trying to do one thing and you're trying to get rid of that and replace it with something that is not functionally the same at all. It doesn't meet the same requirements that your brain is trying to meet. And so one kind of bizarre thing you can try to do. So if your brain is trying to get you to go get on Facebook, get on YouTube, whatever. All right. What does it want from that behavior? It's probably trying to escape from something unpleasant. So it's good to identify what that thing is. And you can think, okay, what are other ways I can escape from that unpleasant thing? It wants to escape in such a way that it doesn't have to exert itself very much physically. It doesn't have to be really actively engaged in whatever it's doing. That's why it's very passive activity when you're scrolling through Facebook or something like that. You need to think about all the different factors that you're the checkboxes your brain is trying to check by engaging in that behavior. Instead of just assuming it's a rational choice or it's just silly. No, there's a reason for it. And so you need to find a behavior that is hopefully more healthy 
but also checks all those boxes. And so one thing you can try if you're the kind of person who gets sucked into like social media holes, I know even like successful entrepreneurs have this issue. One thing you can try to do, this works for some people if it checks the right boxes, is every time you feel that urge to pull out your smartphone and scroll through social media or something, try just staring at the wall instead. I know this seems totally counterintuitive and silly and it won't work for everybody. For a lot of people, it will work because it checks the right boxes for the same type of behavior. And the reason why I'd recommend doing something like that, as opposed to scrolling through social media or something like that, is because it, when you stare at the wall, it, it escapes from whatever it was that you're trying to escape from. It requires very little effort, but it has a very positive effect, which is you get a dopamine reset, which I don't like using that term because I think it's super simplistic, but I think people understand what I'm saying <laughs> when I say that. It's going to also cause your brain if you're doing it correctly which means just staring and not thinking about anything your brain is going to drift into the diffuse state which is where your no particular part of your brain is dominant in other words in its activity it's when you zone out or you like go on walks and you're just zoning out doing the dishes something like that try to zone out like that and what's going to happen is you're going to have all this like creative activity going on and you're going to start to feel like this motivation to go do something that curiosity is going to start welling up inside you. It's really bizarre. So I'm just staring at the wall. <laughs> I love but, this. I love but this. But it can actually work and it can actually make you like, oh, have a great idea. Wonder about something. Oh, that could be really cool to do. And it'll at least get you to think of something that's much better than scrolling through social media. And yeah. it will fill a lot of the same gaps for most people. There are some people where they're, that behavior is doing something else. And so you need to do something that, is more in alignment with that. But for a lot of people, that's all it is. It's just, I want to stop doing whatever I was doing before and I don't want to exert much effort. And this is a good way to occupy myself. And so it checks the right boxes. I, I think the important thing there is that you are still taking an action. So you're not just letting yourself go into whatever behavior that was. You're actually still taking an action to divert your attention, to make a change in behavior. And taking action is the key because if we just leave things as is, we're going to get nowhere. We aren't going to make progress. So I like that you say that, and that's an alternative. So I'm curious though, because for me, when like journaling has always been that thing. Like I'm not good at meditating. And a lot of the reason, I think the reason I'm not good at meditating yeah. is because I'm just my, I'm so much like a ping pong ball inside my head. That mm -hmm. ability to really sit and focus and shut all distractions out is hard for me. But if I take a pen and paper, we know that those neurons are stimulated the same way when we write mm -hmm. and get things out of our brain, similar to meditation. So like for me, that's my go-to because then that creativity is also stimulated and I can actually write down the things that I'm thinking and all of that. So I'm curious to see what your perspective of that is, the journaling versus, cause you said like reading is different than, and you're not going to get that dopamine surge whenever you're reading versus whenever you're on social media yeah. or YouTube. And the same thing with journaling. I don't, you're not really getting a dopamine surge, but you are resetting. This is where the self-experimentation comes into play. A lot of people, they will get advice from maybe somebody like me, they'll try it and it won't work. And then they'll be like, shucks, it doesn't work. I'm going to have to go look for somebody else's advice. And they keep doing that. And this is where I think my story comes into play with the experimentation. This is hard for some people, most people to develop this habit. But if you can develop the habit of when something doesn't work, your first thought should be, well, that's great feedback. Why didn't that work? What was wrong about my understanding that caused me to make an incorrect prediction? If you just do that every day, you will improve drastically because you'll start to find out what works for you. So maybe you heard what I said and you're like, okay, next time I want to get on social media, I'm going to stare at the wall instead. And you find you're not able to do that because that doesn't work for everybody, frankly, because it also depends on who you are and what that social media engagement is actually functioning as what it's doing for you. And so instead you need to reflect on, well, what is it? why do I get on social media in the first place? What does it do for me? What's the function that it fulfills for me? How does it make me feel? Is there anything else that makes me feel that way that fulfills that function and doesn't have the same downsides? Could I try that? Let's try that next time and then see if it has the effect I predict. And that's another thing, making predictions. Most people never make predictions, <laughs> at least consciously, but saying, okay, I'm going to try to, instead of getting on social media, I'm going to try to do 10 push-ups. That's not going to work for most people, by the way, but some people might. 
but you do the 10 push-ups and you're predicting if I do the 10 push-ups, I'm no longer going to feel the need to get on social media. I'm going to feel great. I'm going to feel energized. I'm going to want to get back to work. And then you go do the 10 push-ups, <laughs> and then you say, okay, well, do I feel great? Do I feel like I want to get back to work? Do I feel energized? If the answer to any of those is no, then your prediction was wrong. And that's a great opportunity to learn about yourself. Why was it wrong for me? What did I feel instead? What other things typically cause me to feel that way? Because that's what it's more similar to them. That's the function it's fulfilling. And so that's a way you can start to learn a lot more about yourself. It's complex work and yeah. not complex in the, in, oh, this is so hard to even understand myself. It's complex in regards to taking the time to actually stopping and documenting what it is you're feeling and thinking. And I think that is in my book, I have a, an exercise where I suggest people, if they feel a certain way, start identifying how you feel and then document what that trigger was. So if your stomach's hurting, but you have no explanation as to why your stomach's hurting, when did it start hurting? What were you doing? Who were you interacting with? Is that anxiety bubbling up inside of you? So I think it's the same kind of concept is you have to identify what's driving your behavior before you can actually change your behavior. Yeah, that's true. And you don't have to be super intellectual to do this. And you also like what you just described is a very conscientious approach. Mm -hmm. And some people are not conscientious at all. <laughs> but don't so you feel like, like we have to train our brains to be if we are going to make progress? So changing a person, like a fundamental personality trait like conscientiousness is very difficult and it's not going to change by much. You're not going to be able to shift from somebody who's in the 10th percentile of conscientiousness to the 90th percentile, unless you have like, you do some psychedelics and get hit in the head or something like maybe, but probably not just by trying really hard. So rather than just assuming I'm not an organized person. So anything, any organized approach is just not going to work for me. And that's tough. I guess I'm screwed. It's okay. That might be true, but what you can do is you can think about what is my version of that? <laughs> because a lot of people won't journal, like they just won't journal and it's really hard to get them to journal. It's painful and they won't stick to it for a long time, but something that they will do is so they can do micro experiments like the one I just described. Instead of making long-term predictions, just predict about the next five minutes. So eh, I'm going to try doing these 10 pushups. I want to, I think I'm going to feel this way. Let's see what happens. Do the 10 pushups. How do I feel? That's different. Why? And it's a very short, like it takes you know, it literally takes a couple of minutes to run the entire experiment on yourself rather than, okay, I'm going to write out all of my predictions ahead of time about this long scale experiment. That's super intimidating to people, but you don't need to do that. And you can do it on a super micro level. You don't need to write anything down, even though it's great if you can, but if you can just do it verbally and do it in your head over really short periods of time, that works fine too. For some people, it works really well. And then I guess after you do this so many times, you discover, okay, now I can predict that this is going to work because I know it's worked 10 times in the past. Yeah, or, exactly. And then that becomes your new behavior, your new habit, your new default versus going to pick up your phone and scrolling. Yeah, exactly. You don't need to find the best thing. You just need to find something that's better than what you have right now. And then just keep mm -hmm. doing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I would imagine you can shift. I think our interests, our, uh, our energy levels, everything kind of does shift over time. So you can always shift that if... Mm -hmm need be at a certain period of time. Oh my gosh. We have been talking for a long time and I love this conversation, but I think the big takeaways for me are that when we're sitting in that place of being stuck or we have repetitive, and I'm going to do air quotes, bad habits that we want to break, we can really connect with our brain just by doing these little experiments, making predictions and see if our predictions were correct or false, and then adjust based on the outcome of the experiment that we did to adapt new habits and new behaviors. Yeah, exactly. So if somebody tells you, hey, this is a great thing, this is going to work rather than just trying to grind away doing what they told you. And then being really disappointed after a long time when it hasn't worked for you, 
do it like once, <laughs> make a prediction, see how it works and adjust a little bit. Cause I guarantee like there's no one size fits all silver bullet that works for everybody. And you have to figure that out on your own. And if you're not making predictions, you're not reflecting on how things affect you, how you feel and how your behaviors, the results that you get from them it's going to be really hard to figure out what works for you. You're always just going to be trying something new that works for somebody else. And you're going to go through that process your whole life. and You're never going to find your thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we can't move forward in life and business if we're not doing what aligns with us. So the other big takeaway was the values and aligning with our values to make sure that, and I think that when we are aligned with our values, We have a lot less stress and anxiety because we're rooted in who we are meant to be, who we're called to be versus trying to just please someone else or adapt our behaviors or our mindset based on what the world's expectations of us are instead of what our own expectations are. So this has been incredible. I love this conversation and listeners, just so you know, I always re-listen to every single episode and I do the show notes. So the show notes are really good. So if you have any questions about what Colin said or what, how our conversation went, you can always refer back to the show notes. I know some people need to read to fully understand complex things. I'm one of those people I can hear it, but I still need to read it. So if you are a visual learner like me, then the show notes are really good. And I will have everything in the show notes recapped for you so that it all will make sense if there was any confusion, because it is a complex subject. Our brain is is complex. There's no way to make it easy to understand. So if you are working to shift your mindset or to change behaviors or get unstuck, I think these exercises that Colin has suggested are very helpful, very useful. And of course, we always talk about mindset. So if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. You can reach out to Colin. And Colin, with that being said, will you please tell the listeners how they can connect with you, learn more from you, hang out with you on social media, (laughs) wherever you hang out? Yeah, for sure. I think the best place, if this is something that you're interested in and you really think you could benefit from understanding how to partner with your brain more effectively, which I think everyone can. I do teach an online cohort-based live course. So we interact a lot and it's really fun. You can find that on maven.com and it's the course is called discover your inner super learner. You can type that in or look up my name, Colin Jewett. If you look me up on Google, you'll probably find it too. So that's a good way to go. But yeah, in that course, we dig really deep into, all right, how do you figure out systematically what works really well for you and what works well for your brain, not somebody else's yours. <laughs> and that's what we do. So that's the best place. If you can find me on social media and reach out there, you can send me an email. Uh, Robin's free to post my email address if you want to email me. But yeah, if you're interested in that kind of thing, just let me know and I'd love to help you out. Awesome. And just one last question, Colin, for people who have learning challenges, do these same exercises work to discover how they can learn best? Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the biggest takeaways here is If you don't work in what people call neurotypical ways, which I hate that term, but if you're, if you feel like you deviate in some way, then that's just makes it all the more important to, to try your own things and run experiments, make predictions rather than just trying to look up what works for somebody else. Cause it's probably not going to work for you or at least not work as well as it could. So yes, absolutely. Self-experimentation is key. And that's the most beautiful thing, right? Our uniqueness and how we do everything unique. I love that. All right. With that, listeners, I am going to close out this episode, but we will see you next week.